This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is going to feature someone that you may have seen on the Penn and Teller Foolish television show, or perhaps you may have seen him on the cover of Vanish magazine. Perhaps uh, if you attend uh, college, you may have seen him on your college campus. I know he's kind of been all over the place and continues to as he works not only in the corporate market, but also the uh, college market as well, and is a very entertaining guest. And someone has a really good lecture. If you have an interest in booking his lecture, you might want to get in contact with him because he's got a lot of good information, some of which he will share here this week on our podcast. So let me introduce my guest this week, Mr. Randy Shine, here on The Magic Word. I'd like to welcome today my guest, Mr. Randy Shine, who is someone who has actually been on Penn and Teller Foolis and has uh, also been doing a lot of work on the uh, college circuit as well, and has been on the Penn and Teller Foolis 2, or what was that, the Penn and Teller... Try This at Home 2. Try This at Home 2. I remember they had a book out, yeah, the Try This at Home, and then, then they had, uh, so they made that into a TV show? Was that a special or something? Yes, it, it was on twice, and that's... I was on the second one. That's why it's it's, it's two. It's number two, well, of course. No, <laughs> P-O-O. And basically, it, it's it's their show uh, where they have magicians who are doing magic from their home due to um, you know situation right now. Gotcha. I understand. And so, please welcome my guest right there. You heard him already. <laughs> There's my friend Randy Shine. Hey there, Randy. How are you, sir? Good to see you, Scott. It's been a while, and when I mean that, I mean a while. You when was the last I... time we got together? Okay. This has to be over 15 years ago. Goodness. I was in Texas uh-huh. and uh, in Houston just visiting a friend, and I just looked around. I said, oh, there's a magic club meeting, and I just walked in and sat down, and it was a great time, and you were there, and we chatted, and we have a mutual friend. That's where we figured out we have a mutual friend, Mark D'Souza. Oh, sure. Yeah, and so, yeah, it was it was wonderful. And it just goes to show that I like to say uh, being a magician is like being a, in a secret society because you could go anywhere in the world. Yep. And if they know you're a magician, you know, and, and you know that they're a magician – they're going to welcome you into the brotherhood, regardless okay. of anything else. They're going to treat you like family. It's a it's a warm embrace. And I had learned that so many years ago. I'm going to guess you're probably, what, about 27? No, I'm a little older than that. <laughs> okay. I'm a little older than that. Much older than that. You must have a mirror in the closet someplace or something, or yeah. a picture, I mean, or something, <laughs> Mr. Dorian. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, the... Um, uh, but whenever I was young and I was traveling around a lot and when they had the yellow pages, which mm-hmm. you may not remember, but they <laughs> this was a way that adver- magicians would advertise uh, back mm-hmm. then. And mm-hmm. whenever I was overnight someplace and had some time or got there early, I would see who the magicians were in town, call them. And the first thing they'd say, yeah, let's meet for a drink or dinner or something. Or you're going to be staying late and the next morning we have breakfast or something. And they were just the most welcoming people. And I met so many people that way. And it, they've, uh, you're right. This is a community that transcends really uh, race, religion, um, uh, ethnicities, uh, politics. I mean, whatever it is, everything is set aside. I, I remember a great comment. I was at uh, the 4F convention one year, and mm-hmm. a buddy of mine, uh, John Miller, uh, after the four days were over, said, well, I guess we probably should go back and find out what's been happening for the four days because you never even turn on the television. You have no idea what the news is because – What's the latest card trick? You know, I want to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I want to right. do some magic, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. And the, and the other thing about uh, the magic community, what I found is that even if there is some differences, mm-hmm. magic brings us together where there's a common ground and then there's a mutual respect, but not just respect, 
but there's also a mutual love for each other, even though there are differences. And that's a beautiful thing right there. Very good point. And as you mentioned that, I was just thinking about there are differences in levels of Mm -hmm. not just interest. Some people may be collectors, some people may be illusionists or mind readers or whatever it happens to be, but also different levels within each of those groups. Let's Mm -hmm. say that someone is just uh, learning how to do coin handling, you know, or Mm -hmm. coin moves. And then there are those like David Roth. I mean, there are different, obviously levels throughout that but everybody still accepts you because you have a love and a passion for wanting to learn and to gain more knowledge and to get better you know what i mean exactly exactly mm-hmm. so and it doesn't so matter that, what level you're at you're accepted right and, and, and that, that's what i like to tell sometimes just a little bit you get in these debates or you hear these debates about oh these young guys or these old guys and what i like to say is this for the Young guys, up and coming magicians, there's a lot that you can learn from the more seasoned magicians because they've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, the trophy and a the poster. <laughs> then then for, for for the more seasoned magicians, there are, there's a lot that we can learn from the young guys because they have the time. To sit home and come up with new techniques, new ideas. They know the new technology to use Mm -hmm. and we can learn from them how we could use this technology or whatever to continue our careers, our hobbies, our passions within the magic community. So it's about building that bridge instead of arguing, oh, these young guys, they don't know nothing. Well, if you don't teach them, how would they know? (laughs) Or the young guys, oh, oh, these guys, they're old, they're beyond their time. But guess what? They know a lot more than what you know, because your entry level in the magic starts here. Their knowledge and entry level of magic is years beyond where you started. Mm -hmm. So they know so much more. So we could come together instead of burning those bridges and being uh, adversarial between uh, generations. This is a community. Fortunately enough, you don't hear that too much, but it does come up in pockets and conversations. But I like to jump in those conversations and say exactly what I just said. We all, we can build this this dynasty, this legacy called magic. I think you're right. As far as building bridges and to keep those bridges operating so that there is that crossover and uh, exchange of ideas. <clears throat> I think if you look in general at older people my age or it doesn't matter, even younger than me, a lot of times people will stop at a certain point in their age. And so we seem to have uh, a nostalgia about a point in time that would have been the best times of our lives, whatever that quote unquote best times would be in your life. You know what I mean? And they don't go beyond that. And that includes also learning new things, new technology, uh, Mm -hmm. different methods of communication, of maybe even transportation. I mean, all kinds of things. I mean, the world is out there, but people don't move past that. And Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing wrong with nostalgia. I mean, as we're talking here today, I'm wearing this this T-shirt that says (laughs) Summer of Love from 1967, you know, in Haight-Ashbury. I was there 50 years ago, you know, so in in Haight-Ashbury. So I remember the times, you know, back in the 60s. But I, I continue to move on, and I think it's important to understand what's happening and uh also when people will ask me well have you seen so-and-so's newest trick that's uh, being offered out there by penguin or vanishing mm-hmm. ink or somebody i'm not there's so much out there coming at us quicker now i think than ever because we have more platforms and abilities to share these ideas whereas mm-hmm. before we just had books and then we had the proliferation of desktop publishing so anybody can do books and then it was of course videos that you could do and then it was easy to do it you can buy a cheap camera and then you can have it on your phone so everybody was doing it and so you have to embrace those kinds of things just like we've recently had a conversation we were talking about uh, the use of uh, virtual technology and mm-hmm. how that this will be transcending time, not beyond the 2020s, that we're going to uh, be doing this perhaps even the 2030s, is that we could be performing virtually for corporations and maybe even colleges and everything too. But you got to keep that, your mind open to these ideas. That's true. Uh, I had that conversation also, and I said, wouldn't it be interesting if technology – advances to the point where we're doing a virtual show from our home. However, whatever the platform is created where people all over the country, all over the world could see the show 
but it's as if they're sitting in a theater mm. and they can choose who they want to see with some virtual reality uh, goggles on mm -hmm. and they're looking at you on a stage but in reality you're only home <laughs> sitting home in your pjs right Th that's a weird concept but hey there may be something there that's how we will be performing in the future so we're just gonna have to embrace that now we are actually home doing those the kinds of things needs. right but the way people are viewing us it's as if we're on a stage in the theater dressed a certain type of way and they're literally sitting down they could choose their seat where they want to sit who they want to sit next to the angles um in the in the virtual theater as if they're literally there and went out to an actual live uh, venue do you think it'll be the same thing like with concerts? I mean, not just with magicians, but do you believe gig artists in general? I'm not. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is just that uh, that 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 I crazy idea I have that I will not implement, but I can see happening, and it will happen across all platforms, concerts, mm -hmm. everything else. So symphonies and everything then as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plays and theaters. You don't need to go to New York to see Hamilton. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Yeah>. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I can I can certainly see something like that happening uh, mm -hmm. into the future. We are really on the beginning edge of uh, AR and VR, and those are two things that we need to embrace then also and to understand more perfectly, and not mm -hmm. just for us, but also for the medical profession, let's say, yeah. so that way that yeah. they don't need to do uh, all these x-rays and everything, that they can kind of go in virtually and exactly. look around, kind of like the Fantastic, or what was that, Fantastic Journey? What was that? Remember years ago, there was an old movie about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, they injected the a person into their a submarine. Body. They, they yeah, reduced yeah. these guys in size to a, in a submarine, then they reduced that in size to a, yeah, and then injected them, and they kind of went around and saved this person. So I, something weird like that, that you can look around in someone's body, plus geologists will be able to look below the Earth's surface and see what we're doing to the Earth's core or to different formations and where the oil and gas is and where it's not and be more efficient with our land's resources, you know? But. You know, in listening to this conversation, like we're five, ten minutes in, this is one of the things I love about being a magician and being a part of this community. And that is we have a vast knowledge of a lot of things that we could talk about, <laughs> not just magic. You see how we went from magic to that's a very good point. That's technology. a good point. It is great, and I think that that's something that that we should be embracing and mm -hmm. looking outside of our art. And what is it? I mean, first of all, that uh, yeah, we should be experts in our field. But if you talk with any expert in any field, you can also have conversations with them at a cocktail party or wherever else about mm -hmm. I don't care whether there's going to be a sports or medicine or politics mm -hmm. or whatever other kinds of areas of interest, and mm -hmm. they would have. A, a lucid and intelligent conversation about something else. So it's important for magicians to also study other things and to read another book that's not magic related. Every once in a while, just think about that. Think about reading another book. Yeah, <laughs> it's not yeah. magic, you know. But, but I'm sure our listeners want to hear so, so more about magic. Oh well, that's true. That's yeah. why they tune into this. They can they can do that later. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Um, and uh, in that regard, so tell me that when you said that you've been doing a lot of um, colleges and um, are you were you working in a particular area or across the United States? Or do you have representation? You go to NACA. I mean, how would you uh, get involved in doing all that? Yes, I've been in the college market for around 10 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Time flies. Ten years. Since you were uh, seventeen, then. Yeah. <laughs> as I said you're twenty-seven. <laughs> and, and and I have a, um, I, I do have representation, and you go, I go to a conference called NACA. Mm -hmm. Um, I travel all across the nation, all across the nation, uh, performing at colleges and universities. It is a wonderful, but challenging market to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say that being in the college market. You are, I would say, probably five levels down from being an A-list celebrity. Let me explain okay. what I mean by that. Uh, anyone who's who's working the college market, you would know that a lot of great performers that we know came out of the college market. 
Natalie's, Natalie Stovall, who is a country singer, phenomenal. I remember seeing her uh, uh, at these con- at NACA conferences. Uh, and she was just just really doing well booking universities all across the, c- the country. Next thing I know, she is on the CMAs, Country Music Awards. Wow. Performing. Kevin Hart came out of the college market, one of the most known comedians now. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know he did a comedy or a college circuit. Hmm. Yes, Kevin Hart. Uh, Ta Sho, another comedian. Came yeah, out not of the, Tosh uh, point oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Margaret Chow, Chow. Came, mm-hmm. out, came out of the college market. Uh, someone that we all know in the in the in the magic community, Matt Franco came out of the college market. Justin Wilman came out of the college market. And so and part of the reason why I said what I initially said is because the college market, if you're working it, you are touring. You're touring much like an A-lister without all those perks. <laughs> you don't have a road manager. You don't have anyone bringing you food and all this other stuff. But it is basically training you if you want to go to that level, to know what it's like and experience being on the road, setting up, dealing with your agent, dealing with uh, the venue, those types of things. Uh, and it's it's so that's why I said what I said. Uh it's it's challenging because um, you are trying to get booked by schools mm-hmm. and someone will come in and say, hey, I'm a magician and you know what? I'm competing with all these magicians. You're not competing with all the magicians. You're competing with every entertainer there, <laughs> every speaker there, because schools have limited number of of finances and dates that they're going to bring artists in. They will love to bring hundreds of artists and entertainers and speakers in, but their budget only allows a certain amount. Mm-hmm. So you need to figure out, well, they need to figure out who they want to be, uh, bring in. And so that's where your performance comes into play. That's those types of things, the relationships you have with those schools. That's a great idea. I really hadn't thought about that, where you shouldn't be comparing yourselves against others who are like you in your unique field of magician, mentalist, or whatever that is, but all entertainers. Am I better than a right. hilarious comedian or whoever? And, 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 and I say that, and I do say that, but also you're not there to actually compete. You just got to be there to be the best person, entertainer that you are. Mm-hmm. and stand out so uh, for example i know that there's been several schools that i performed in uh one particular school i'm thinking about in pennsylvania they must love magicians because <laughs> the week i was there they said oh last week we had a, a magician norman Inc. i said why did you schedule a magician at right after another magician oh we like magicians here and the week and two weeks after me, they had another magician coming in. Wow. But they like magicians. Sure. But the, also what they saw at the conference was we see three magicians with three different styles. Wow. OK, so sure. We could bring these magicians in another school in huh. Pennsylvania. They brought they brought me in. And I was got there early and I saw posters on the wall and I saw my friend Eric Diddleman. He's coming in the week right after me. Mm-hmm. So I called Eric and I said, hey, you're going to be here. I'm here now. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, well, he's a he's a mind reader. I'm a magician. So it worked for them. But we're <laughs> both part of the mystery arts. That's mm-hmm. true. I understand. And what's interesting is how that some schools, I'm sure, would like that. Or they may like country music, so they have a lot of country musicians. Or they may like mm-hmm. comics or whatever it is. It's just that pocket happens to enjoy our entertainment, magic and magicians. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when it comes down to that, then I think it'd be kind of interesting also that there might be even some similarity of effects selected, let's say linking rings, as an example. Mm-hmm. But yours would be different from mine, different from Joe Blow's, different from Sue Smith's or whomever that we're all a little bit different. And I think that they appreciate that from an artistic standpoint. It's like, he did a beautiful job. Didn't somebody else do that last week? Yeah, but he did it, or she did it so much differently than they did before. 
Uh, and then, on the other hand, I remember talking with Banachek one time, and he was saying, I kind of regret that we had put out the psychokinetic pins because of the, the tipping pin. Right. Because he said that if when he got downgraded, in other words, when he got negative comments from the schools, mm-hmm. it would be, oh, we had a magician in here who had also done that tip pin right. thing. And it's like, right. what, that was mine. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that does happen. And, um, but... What I found is that magicians who know each other in the college market, mm-hmm. we will call each other up. We will say, hey, you, were you at this school? How was the school? What was the dynamics? Where, yeah. where, where, where did you perform? What did you do? Because I don't want to repeat something that you've done. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so we have that mutual respect. Or if a magician is known, particularly known for a particular effect, mm-hmm. It's done differently. Let's say build to impossible locations. So one person may put it in a lemon. One person may put it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But essentially, it's the same effect. And uh, spectators, they really don't know those little nuances. They just know it went to an impossible place. Right. So, But I know that a particular magician has a better way of doing it, not technically, just in a presentationally way of doing it. I was I will call him up. I'm like, hey, I'm at this school. I know you've been here or you're coming here. I was planning on doing Bill to Impossible Location. Uh, are you doing are you still doing that in your ad? Are, do you plan on doing that when you come to this school? They will say yes. And I will say, you know what? I'm going to take it out. Mm-hmm. I like your version. And I know your version is going to rock the crowd. Mm-hmm. I don't steal your shine. Mm-hmm. So go ahead, you do it. I could replace that with something else. Or sometimes they would say, "Oh no, go ahead, man. It's fine. Go ahead, just do it." And I'll come up with something else. That's that. That's what I like. That communication, that mutual respect for each other in this market. That we will talk to each other. And well, we I think will work on things. it's the same thing whenever that you're working a venue. And mm-hmm. there are the magicians who are working with you of not repeating the tricks and whatever. I was, I used to be a house magician at the Magic Island here in Houston, and I, it, for a while, we had a third room. We had we have two close-up rooms and a stage. Well, it was Cleopatra's Chamber, which was mm-hmm. the essentially uh, a stand-up type of thing. Uh, right. And then we had the Palace of Common. Well, the Invisible Ink. I haven't seen or heard from them in years and years, but they had a fantastic act. And what they had some of us as the close-up magicians to go whenever that there was a busy night to go and do something then in the parlor area in Cleopatra's chamber. Well, mm-hmm. I had brought with me some linking coat hangers, and I was as part of my routine I was going to be doing, not knowing that Invisible Ink was going to be in that week, and that was an integral part of their routine. But mm-hmm. because they're friends and they were doing that in the stage, I wasn't going to be doing the same trick. It, with my presentation in the next room, when there are so many tricks to do, it's just yeah. as easy for me to leave out that when they have specifically brought that and have it choreographed and everything, as opposed to mine being a throwaway kind of a thing. So as soon as right. I knew that they were going to be doing that, it's like, that's out. So right. and, and likewise, whenever that um, you're going and working in a venue with some other close-up magicians, say, okay, what's in your set? If you're doing ring flight, I'm not going to do that. Or, mm-hmm. you know, if you're doing an ambitious card, then I won't do that. Or, you know, certain people have are, are well-known and do certain effects really well. It's like, okay, you keep that, but I'm going to be doing something that's my specialty. Recently, right. in the lecture that I heard you talk about, it resonated with me that you were saying, you decided to get rid of card tricks and you would open with thimbles tricks mm-hmm. and then decided the rest of the night not even to do any card tricks. Mm-hmm. And the reasons that, you know, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, I think were things that I hadn't really thought about, but I do myself. I rarely open with a card trick, rarely, when I'm approaching a group of cocktail setting or sit down situation. And when you said that, then it's like, well, that's the reason. I mean, I don't know why I have subconsciously been doing that forever. But when you mm-hmm. said it, it's like, I want to kiss you. This is beautiful. <laughs> it's exactly what I, why that I've been doing that. So would you share? Go ahead. Yes, yes. So uh, when you heard me uh, talk about why I don't open up with a card trick, I, first of all, I admitted that we all love card tricks. That's sure. what you but there was a reason why I decided not to open up with card trick at a point at a certain point in time in my career. And that was because number one, I want to uh the expectations of a magician and what they perform. I wanted to shift that. People think that, oh, you're a magician, card trick. 
Okay. <laughs> the other reason is because if you're performing with other magicians, you know everyone's going to start off with a card trick. So my thing, and I want to, uh, what, what is the word? I don't want people to think, oh, I know a card trick too. Or, oh, my son does a card trick. That kind of lowers your status from their perspective, from their perspective. And it's not that they're saying that in a mean way, but it's like if there's nothing special because I could do a card trick and then oh my son could do a card trick. So you either have to hit him with a nice hard hitting card trick. But if you just do something different, you're like, oh, hold on. This is different. Coins. Mind reading. Thimble. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't expect this. (laughs) Now you engage them. Now they really want to come in and see. Right. Because, oh, it's a card trick. Now, the card trick will be good. They will love it. They will scream, clap, laugh, high, give you high fives. But if you start off with something different, that s- separates you from every other magician or any other pr- pr- uh, perspective they had of a, of a magician. Mm-hmm. If they expected a card trick. Then you can move on into a card trick later on in your set. Right. But you started off with something different. You brought them in. It's different. It's unique. They didn't expect this. It, it, and you don't have that hurdle to jump over yes. first thing when you come to their to their Thank table. You. Thank you. Yes, that's mm-hmm. it. And I like to do something that's in my hands first mm-hmm. when I'm stone walk around a stroll and magic. And the reason why I like to start off with with, with something in my hands first. It's number one is that they may be, they may have a cocktail in their hand or hors d'oeuvres in their hands, and that could be a little bit awkward. I want them to be comfortable with me. Sure. So the first part is just visual, especially if they're sitting down at the table. Uh, I know that what I like to do, I don't like to carry around a table. It works for some magicians. For me, it doesn't. So at a table, everyone is looking up at me. That's a subtle little, a little subtlety. Everyone's looking up on me. So I'm creating this little psychological stage. Look up at the performer. Mm-hmm. Things are happening here. So you hold um, your hands up closer hands to your face up. rather than holding them down your crotch. Yeah. You don't want them to focus on that. You want them to focus right. on your face. Face, smiling. They see me. Trick. Now I got them in. Then we can move on to some other things. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then they're comfortable, like, oh, this is really cool. This is a guy that I like to see more of or a woman I would like to see more of. Okay. So then if I have to set something on the table or do something on the table, they're comfortable with me now. I'm not just coming in invading their space and like, what is this about? Who is this? Who is this guy? Yeah. Why are you here? Why are you putting this a deck of cards on the table? I'm eating here. But you're now a friend of theirs. You've introduced your personality. They're comfortable with you, and they are more or less psychologically inviting you to join them. Exactly. There you go. There you go. But you were about to say something. Uh, No, just that. I was just going to say yeah about how that I think it's important that you have crossed that barrier then to begin with to Mm -hmm. engage them. They want to invest their time with you for a moment as opposed to just walking up with a deck of cards and saying, hey, pick a card. Yep, you know, whatever. Get out of here. But if you're going to be saying – I, even as corny as that might be, did somebody lose a knife, <laughs> right. <laughs> red right. knife. Well, I'm, I, I don't like that particular trick as an opening. Right. A lot of people do, but that's just not for me. It's different. That's, it also gets their attention, and I can understand the psychology of that. Mm-hmm. But there are other kinds of things like that where I would walk up to a cocktail group. If there are women, I would mm-hmm. often begin with a sponge rabbit routine, which mm-hmm. I'd say, oh, Excuse me, but you had a hair out of place just a minute, and then they kind of look over their shoulder, and then I reach right. up and, of course, produce a hair, and then that that's the beginning of the whole routine, and they just scream from there. Mm-hmm. Likewise, whenever I'm working with a group of men, I wouldn't be doing a sponge rabbits or anything right. at all, but I do Hundy 500 because mm-hmm. men usually in a cocktail group, they're interested in talking about money or sports or their, co- their company or business or something, and if you want to make some money in your business or want to invest, I start bringing mm-hmm. that out, changing one to hundreds immediately gets their attention because that's so strong and visual within 30 seconds is yes. that you got their attention. And mm-hmm. then you can go on to pretty much anything because you got them on your side. Whatever it is that is your initial icebreaker, it's important for you to make that connection and build that bridge, kind of going back to what we were saying before as far as the bridges between the older and younger magician, but also between you and your uh, your audience. 
Correct. You know? Correct. Correct. And uh, Hundy 500 is great to do as an opener. Uh, because you know somewhere down the line, even though uh, it's something that people often say, can you uh, change my money into something? Sure. That's a bit, even though that's something they expect, that's something that they truly don't expect, if that makes sense. They don't believe that that is possible. So it's what? just like, uh, right. yeah, can you make my wife disappear? And so I'll right. say, excuse me, just a minute. I'll say, ma'am, would you just take my arm? And we'll start to walk away <laughs> or something. Right. But no, right. they don't believe you're really going to do that. Same things right. like they don't believe you're going to change one. So I wish, yeah, we've had hundreds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. But then so, you do it. And then you do it. Then you do it. So, yeah. And then like, whoa, hold on. He really did that? Oh, okay. Now the conversation starts. Right. And you have the conversation. You can move on to other material that you can perform. So I, 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 would, I would recommend or suggest, I should say, that uh, the magicians who are listening listening to this podcast is just try that a couple times. And that is opening without a card routine. And, and just see, gauge it. And we have a lot of material that we can use. We could do ring on string. You could do a uh, coin routine, routine with uh, paper currency, uh, a lot of mentalism routines. You have a lot that you can do. And when you're developing that, let me also suggest for those who are listening intently to this point is to make it a quick thing. In other mm -hmm. words, that I think you should have an opening of about a 30 second trick. When you yeah. open with thimbles and you show your hands empty and then boom, there's the first thimble. It's like, where did that come from? Same thing mm -hmm. with the ones to hundred. Boom. It just happens quickly. When mm -hmm. I pull a, uh, a rabbit, from, a sponge rabbit, you know, boom, where did this come from? And then mm -hmm. it splits into two. I mean, boom, boom, boom. A lot of things happen. The point is, number one, should be visual. Number two, it should be a non-card thing. And number three, that should be quick. Correct. 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 And uh, I, 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 I often say this is, is that... Uh, don't have a five second trick and a five minute pattern. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. Don't have a five minute trick and a five second pattern. Because then people are just like, okay, what is he doing? He's just going through all these procedures. There's a balance that you have to have. That's true. Uh, with, with your presentation, you have to maintain that balance. And, uh, Scripting and writing, I know it's been it's challenging for me, but it's something that I have to do. As mm -hmm. two days ago, I was just rescripting some things for my virtual show because mm -hmm. uh, I need to keep that balance. When scripting, you want it to be engaging, okay? Mm -hmm. And engaging doesn't necessarily mean length of time or how much you're talking. Um, it has to be intriguing. Yeah, you don't want to just be talking to talking, to be talking. I, I hate it when you start to overuse things like, I want you to do me a favor. Or, <laughs> right. will you help me with something? Uh, right. Or, there are certain things that are crutches that we all, all of us lean on, and all we need to start looking at tightening that script and throwing those things out. Exactly. Uh, and this is, this is what I recommend. This is what I do. Uh, if you want to test to see if your script really works or a story you're saying that's related to a trick mm -hmm. tell it to a group of people or friends without doing the trick and see if they're interested see if they're going to lean in see if they're going to laugh see if they're going to like hmm whatever and you could even talk about the trick oh so if you're describing here's the trick and then you're yeah. using the same right. presentation or script even though you don't have the coins cards or sponge right. balls or whatever okay hmm. So a way I would do it, and it's done several times. It's it's done this way in magic, but here's a way I would do it for a layperson without doing the tricks. Let's say if I'm doing a a, a cups a cups and balls routine, and I have some funny lines or things that I think are funny and interesting, and I'm talking to a bunch of friends, and I and they know I'm a magician. I'm like, you know what? I saw this trick before, and it was just really incredible. I was at a street fair and this guy did X, Y, and Z and whatever, whatever. And you just go through the trick and what he did and see if they're interested. See if they react to that. See if they're, uh, if they're like, wow, that's, that's cool. Really? What did you miss? You must have turned your head when he did that. Or mm -hmm. they're like, hmm, that's really good. Oh, wow. They're going to react somehow. 
And if it, if if they're really listening and in tune to what you're saying, what you're describing, like you know what, I can use that same pattern when I'm actually performing the trick now. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's that's just one way. Now sometimes people just tell stories as transitions between tricks. All right, that you you're really not performing, but it's mm-hmm. just just used as a transition. Do the same thing. Tell that story when you're out in dinner with a couple of friends and see if it works. See if it gets a laugh. You know, and if it does, uh, I tried that yesterday. Uh, I was talking to a f- friend on the phone and we we're talking about how I got interested in magic. And I said, you know what? I got interested when I was in graduate school, which is true. And I had no intentions of being a magician. Magic was a hobby. And I started hanging around with the wrong crowd. <laughs> okay. Magicians. And see, you just laughed. Yeah. That's- do what my friend did. My friend laughed That's because I, I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. I pa- she, she laughed, then I said magicians. Let, right there, told me it worked. So it's all about now, timing. Yeah. So I said, <laughs> now that is going in to my to my act yeah. because I normally uh, tell how I really got into magic, and that is true. But it's, it was this story that was a little bit too long. Mm-hmm. And I said, I need to narrow this down. I really need to narrow narrow this down because it's a little bit too long going through my whole life story and well, how I got into magic and everything. Interesting, but but when I started rewriting my script and I said that, I was like, oh, it got a nice little funny line, wrong crowd, but pause, whatever. Yeah, there you go. You're not always going for the laugh either. It just could be a mm-hmm moment or they lean in. Like when I talk about when I used to live in South Africa and when I talk about that, I can actually see the audience just leaning in a little bit. Because you're telling them something personal. Personal, personal. Thank you. I'm glad that you brought that up. Authenticity. Authenticity is great and use it. Don't be afraid of being different. Don't be afraid of being different. In this magic world, I couldn't be anyone but me, even when I tried to be someone else. And the reason being is because I'm African American. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. And so, and so, 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 what I'm saying, just, just the, just by aesthetics, I'm different. So why don't um, you embrace that? Why don't you just embrace that? Yeah, it's it's and, like a. Uh, talking about the elephant in the room, it's like if you are a big person, you may as well make you know make some uh, recognition joke or observation saying, yeah, you probably noticed that I can't hide behind a telephone pole, you know, let alone hide behind an elephant. They I still stick out or whatever, you know. Exactly. You, gotta, mm-hmm. uh, you know what? A comedian that I know in Philadelphia, it, it, that was that's his opening line. Hmm. He addresses the elephant in the room because he's a he's a heavy set guy. Yeah, heavy set guy. Joe, he comes on stage and he says, he's really big. He says, let me move this microphone so y'all can see me better. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> that is so funny to me. Yeah. That is so funny. Well, he dressed an elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah. A buddy of mine also, uh, Bob Rees in Ohio, is a big fella. And the funny, the funny thing is also his uh, beautiful wife is just the opposite of him and whenever they're on stage that he'll stand there when the curtains open he'll say a few lines and introduce his wife and she walks out from behind him <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, and see that's that's the stuff that that's great because it can only it's authentic and it's only you can do and that's what makes you stand out and unique as a performer don't mm-hmm. try to run from that i know we all have our little insecurities but if you work through that that is gold. You take lemon and you make a lemon orchard with it. That's what you do. Yeah, good point. Uh, right. And one other example of that, and this is something that I actually did. I was performing college market in Iowa, flew into Des Moines, Iowa, had to drive two and a half hours or so to this college town. It was parents weekend and this place was packed. And the reason why, I, and let me preface this: when you're performing in the college market, 
everything is not these huge theaters. Sometimes you're performing in the cafeteria. Sometimes you're one time I had to perform in the hallway. <laughs> sometimes standing on a table in the student union or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So this is one of those special times. Parents weekend. They had me in a nice theater around 500 people there. I'll peek. I was like, oh, my gosh, because when I walked, got, got into the town, I was like, OK, all right, I know what I'm dealing with. When I walked onto the stage, the first thing I said, ladies and gentlemen, when I drove into town tonight, the black population increased by 100 <laughs> percent. Everybody laughed. Yeah, they kind of looked around, and said, hmm, probably, <laughs> yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. Everybody laughed. But you know what? I dressed the elephant in the room off the off the start of the show it go. was funny i had him on my side we had a great time that is one of my favorite shows that i performed for in the college market but it's something you take something and you use it without being offensive <laughs> uh, uh but it's funny we, right. like hey we're here to have a good time let's watch the show in that regard, without really going into all of your lecture, which is wonderful and I'd recommend for people to, to watch and to book, uh, that you also talk about crowd, crowd dynamics and getting the crowd on your side. Can you talk a bit about that? <laughs> yes. Um, there's a lot of conventions or techniques that you can use to get the crowd on your side and keep them engaged throughout the show. So I like watching comedians, and comedians do this technique called crowd work. And that's where they normally just point to someone in the audience. They say, oh, who are you with? Are you married? And for the most part, I don't like this. I don't recommend this. But comedians will kind of insult that person. Now, we could use that technique of crowd work without insulting. Sure. So you could see someone in the audience and you could, you know, to say where you're from and you start to make a connection with them. And you're like, oh, yeah, I still live there. Oh, yeah. And you start talking about places. And I normally break and, and look at the rest of the audience. I said, oh, we're just having a bonding moment for a moment. <laughs> we're just having a bonding moment. And the audience get that. They, they, it's a little chuckle. And they're like, OK, we're in on this because they were in on this personal conversation that I was having with this one individual. Right. And they're like, well, what's going on with the show? What about us? And I just look at them. Oh, we're just bonding. That's one way. That's yeah. technical. Another way uh, that you could uh, involve the audience is that when you're performing, make sure you do something that involves the entire audience. Now, this is uh, uh, something that is old hat cliche in the magic community, but that whole twist in the arm thing, that's a great way to get the entire audience involved. And there are other things that you can do. Please do not do Max Maven's thing because, you know, right. that's Max's. That's but Max's, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there are other things. And I found one in a book uh, that it's not a trick, but it's a way of getting the entire audience involved. And when they do it, they're like, oh, that's interesting. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So you want to do something that involves the entire audience. And then a third way that I do to get the audience involved in the trick is something I learned by watching my father. Now, let me give you some preface. OK, to, please. My, my father, for, since I came out the womb, is a African-American Baptist pastor. Okay. Now, if you ever been to a black church, <laughs> I have. They do these things to get the crowd involved. So, involved. Boy, do they. Yes. <laughs> On their feet and yes. hands in the air. Yes. Yeah. I'm watching my dad preach, and I said, I could use that in it's my a show. show. It's a show. It's a show. <laughs> yeah. So there's a point where I'm doing the egg bag routine. I love that routine. Mm, too. I'm doing the egg bag. Then the last phase of the egg bag is where the spectator is holding the bag. I asked the spectator to look inside the bag. Did they see anything? They say no. I said, OK. All right. Hold it out. Hold up your right hand. Wiggle your fingers. Snap your fingers. Good. Then I look at the audience. I said, you're five seconds away from a shout. Reach inside. Take out the contents. Hold it up high. The audience goes off. Where did I get that from? Seeing my dad preach and he's getting to the crescendo of the sermon 
And he says, you're five seconds away from a Holy Ghost hallelujah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and so he gets to the crescendo, says the whatever the last line, everyone's hallelujah, whatever, whatever. Right. Use that. Now, I took that and reframed it. Or here's something else I do on my show. After I finish an effect, whatever it is, I look at the audience. I tell the audience, turn to your neighbor and give him a high five and say, that magician is cool. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, too. <laughs> so they do that. And so now they're interacting in the show. They feel like they're really part of the show. Right. They're turning to and see the other thing is if they're sitting next to someone that they don't know. High five, and we may not high five now because we're not doing live right. shows, but you, you you get the sentiment of what I'm talking about. Uh, they look at their neighbor. Now, just the fact that you give someone a high five, that's a connection, a physical connection. Right. Then it's also the psycho, psychological connection that we're here and we're experiencing this together. Mm. The crowd People. is all now one. Yeah. Yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, That's great. I, what I also like is not you've just said a lot of things about your father in that uh, particular thing saying you're just five seconds away from a moment that you're going to do or say <laughs> X. And I learned that uh, some time ago that if you can tell your audience just before that you reveal the cup, the ball under the cup or whatever, say, as soon as I do this, you're not, or they turn the card over, it's the one that they thought it was going to be a uh, surprise or whatever, that you're going to react, you're going to say, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Or tomorrow, you're, when you talk to your people, your friends at the office, you're going to say such and such. But, or you're going to applaud and say whatever. The point is that, particularly in close-up magic, people don't know how to react. They don't know, should I applaud, should I laugh, or whatever. So you are telling them what to say psychologically and subliminally, that's still there. So whenever that you reveal that surprise, it's mm. like, they're going to say exactly what you just told them five seconds ago. And by you mm -hmm. saying, when you reach inside, you're five seconds away from shouting. <laughs> I mm -hmm. love that. That is fantastic right. because you told them to shout. They do whenever right. that they realize what's inside the bag. I love mm -hmm. that. That's wonderful. Now, 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 I must say, I've never been a fan of begging for applause. Mm -hmm. but, they, but what I just said is a creative way of getting a reaction. A reaction, it isn't exactly. exactly. So it's a, it's a little different than say, hey, if this works, every uh, everyone's going to stand up to their feet and give me a standing ovation because my son always wanted to <laughs> know if I got to. Yeah. So <laughs> that, to me, that's kind of got to be a little. If you're going to ask so, for a reaction or a standing ovation, you got to be creative with it. A little bit. Yeah. There's one exception because there's always this, a, a, exceptions to the rule, and. Maybe there's some others that I don't know about, but it is so funny. Uh, a friend of mine, Joshua Masato, people may know him for his Masato rings. Masato rings, sure. Yes. He's doing his Masato rings, and he does this one link. And normally no one says anything because he's already done a link, you know, a couple of links before. He looks and he says, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm from a little town called Clap a Lot, and I'm feeling kind of homesick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I like that from Clap a Lot. Like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, now I like that. I'm yeah. not going to take it because it's his. Yeah. But uh, I'm like, Josh, that <laughs> is hilarious. That is a nice, clever, creative way of asking for applause. Yeah. I'm homesick from Clap a but it's Lot. Funny. Yeah. From a little town from called Clap a Lot, and I'm feeling kind of homesick. <laughs> and before I forget it, one thing I wanted to go back to for just a moment, you were talking about your father being a pastor, and mm -hmm. I remember when I, I'm Methodist, and my older son was an acolyte, and mm -hmm. before, just as the service was beginning, the preacher was saying, okay, you know, light the candles that uh, walking out, I mean, mm -hmm. your, your things go out there and light the candles. And my son looked through the curtains back there, and he was saying, we don't have enough of a crowd out there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, it's not one of your dad's magic shows. It's time to get going. So go right, right, <laughs> light right, the candles. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You need a bigger audience. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, so it's just a perspective of that then well, as well. So I think it's important. You've got a good point of trying to have that audience dynamic so that people are not reacting in pockets, people laughing or applauding here or there, but you get them all together and right. uh, reacting the way they should as you lead them along w your journey mm -hmm. as yeah. one. Yeah, so yes, you want to bring everyone in together. At least my my approach is 
It's not just look at me what I do on stage. Mm -hmm. And we have a tendency to do that. Look at me. Look at me. I'm doing all these incredible, amazing things. But if you can make it truly an experience and an interactive experience, we say it's interactive, but how truly interactive is it throughout the show? You may do one interactive trick and it's not just about tricks. How do we include the audience in this experience where Mm -hmm. everyone can go home and say, yo, I really felt like I was part of the show. I participated in the show, whether through a trick that everyone did or the magician had a conversation with me. He was funny. There were some things that he said and did that I can relate to. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm going to go back to the thing that I say with my father. Uh, There's been people who said, you know what? I know exactly what you're talking about because I've been to a black church before. (laughs) I like that experience. Or they're like, yeah, well, I'm from this faith and whatever. Even some atheists, they're like, that's kind of cool. They don't believe in uh, any uh, higher power, but they're like, that's kind of cool. See, it's something that we all can relate to. Good point. In some Mm -hmm. some way. So if you could bring all that common ground, like we said before, magicians in our community, we have this commonality that we could set aside differences. But if we have common ground in terms of experience that we share in our act, Mm -hmm. gosh, that's a stronger show. That's a stronger show. It's not a magic show. It's an experience. Right. And magic is the conduit. Right. It's just the vehicle, basically, yeah. to get mm-hmm. you there. That, that's true. Um, mm-hmm. Just real quickly then also, without going into all the details about your lecture, there, can you kind of outline some of the points that you cover in your lecture? Okay. Yeah. My lecture is, uh, first of all, it's it's not a highly trick lecture. Which I uh, like about that. Right. I mean, we know I'm, enough tricks, but I also like to learn some things, too. Right, but. Right. We all like tricks. I, I have maybe three tricks in my lecture, lecture that I uh, that I show, that I perform and explain. And it's always why I perform those tricks, and uh, yeah, why. And that means the environment. Is it a close up trick? Is it a parlor trick? Is it a stage trick? Is it a combination? And the variations of that. So tricks. But then also. I talk about some of the things we just discussed today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Engage from the stage. How do you engage your audience? What are some techniques that you can use? The importance of being authentic uh, on on stage. We always talk about originality and be yourself, but I like to dig deeper on authenticity Mm -hmm. in in performance. Let's dig a little bit deeper. And psychological techniques, as we talked about on enhancing the effect, engaging the crowd, and creating this uh, environment and community. And in the lecture, I like to also, well, the lecture you saw, we talked about virtual magic. Mm -hmm. And the pros and cons of it, it's more pros than cons, and also why this virtual thing is not going anywhere, even when we go back to normal. And Mm -hmm. if you decide when we go back to normal, uh, to stop doing virtual shows, you're missing out on an opportunity to get more shows. It's another revenue stream. <laughs> it's another revenue stream. And let me give a quick example of that. If you're doing a live show, if you're scheduled to do a show, a live show at 5 p.m., and it's a half hour from your home, mm-hmm. and you get a call to do another show live and this show is an hour and a half from your first show and that happens and it happens but you won't be able to make it in time Mm -hmm. because your first show ends at a particular it starts at five ends at six but the other show is an hour and a half away and they want that show 6 30 you can mm-hmm. easily say to your client, I'm not going to be able to make it live, but I can do a virtual show for you, which gives you time to get home because you're only a half hour away from that first show. Good point. Get, get into your studio, set up, 
and you're able to do that show virtually. So use the technology to your advantage. I like to say adapt and thrive, not adapt and die. Love it. We have, we have to evolve and use. We may not like it, but it is what it is. So if we want to still perform, whether for whether it's your profession, whether it's for a hobby, whether it's just for whatever, just to make someone's day, embrace this and use it to your advantage. I would say that the thing you're talking about where you might have some shows that either get double booked or closely booked are typically mm-hmm. for most magicians, uh, particularly part-time professionals or amateurs, mm-hmm. might be during the holidays. So mm-hmm. Christmas time that you're going to be having these opportunities that you can't do them all, but here mm-hmm. you can do most, if not all, with yeah. adding the virtual show. And then you might say, well... But it's going to be a real show, for an example, that they want me to perform as their after-dinner speaker and people are going to be having dinner. Okay, you can still do this. Just say that if you talk with the banquet manager, they can lower a screen. You could do some sort of a, a live projection, basically, and this way that everybody will be able to see doing close-up or whatever it is you're going to be doing on the right. big screen and be able to interact more personally than they would if they saw you live. So actually virtual yeah. could be better if, again, you tell the client – we can make your experience even better virtually than if I am there live. So why don't we try to do that, and I'll work with you and your banquet manager to get the proper uh, media that you need in order to project this and let everybody be involved. And they could even have, I you know, go to some extent where they could have buttons they could push to for multiple choice or get the crowd involved, all kinds of things right. you could do, depending upon how much money they wanted to spend for the event. But there are other kinds of things I'm saying that, that uh, just don't say, no, that won't work for me. Yes, it can. <laughs> yes, it can. Here's the other thing that I hear. Uh, well, it's not the same performing live. No, it's not. It's a different animal. The, right. it's, right. it's like it, there's a difference between performing close-up magic tricks, a close-up show, and an illusion show. There's a difference. <laughs> and so this virtual thing is a difference. It's, a, it's, it's kind of like a crazy, weird hybrid between a live show mm-hmm. and – watching a show like as if you were watching a magic show on television. Right. It's a kind of hybrid between the two. The other thing is this. It's like, well, I'm not, I like that live energy that you could feel when you're on stage and that interaction. Well, there's ways that I'm not going to share now. I'll share for you uh, at my lecture that you can kind of get that mm-hmm. not totally, but you can get that. But also here's something that that's important. Anyone under 40, anyone under 40, they grew up on the screen, on their phones. Right. They're accustomed to this. They're used to this. Mm -hmm. That's their norm. Just look at teenagers, children, anyone under 40 now. It's always on the phone, on the screen. So... For those who are not used to, or magicians or entertainers who are used to doing live shows like we, well, the majority of us are, we have to come to terms that they're used to it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it's more, we have to change our frame of mind <laughs> that it can work. That's a good point. Because <laughs> they're used to looking at a screen. So if your client is under 40, they are more likely to understand, appreciate, and do book this kind of a show that we're talking about as opposed to someone's older is going to say, mm, that's going to be a little bit more difficult, and I don't understand how it's going to work. And, 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 and uh, that's not a blanket statement because you have people who are over 40 mm-hmm. who are in the teaching profession. And even though it's more so now, teachers have been doing virtual conferences anyway. <laughs> sure, yeah. So they're used to it. Yeah. They're so they're used to this. And you have people in corporate who are particularly work in corporate deal, uh, international corporations. So mm-hmm. they're used to doing stuff on the screen meetings and, 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 and things of that nature because they may have an office in Houston, Texas, but they have to get up four o'clock in the morning because they have a virtual meeting in Singapore. Right. Their office over there. And they've been doing this way prior to 2020 also. So this is nothing new to them. Exactly. It's nothing new to them. So uh, we just got to get it out of our frame of mind that they're not going to get it. 
oh, they're not going to get it. Who wants to watch something on screen? Well, they do it all the time. That's <laughs> so, right. That's right. So, so can we get entertainment on screen? Oh, yes, that's better than a boring meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, because I believe people want to smile every day, and magicians make them smile. And, again, just think about how that you are not competing against other magicians. You're competing against other types of entertainment, which will also include other virtual types of entertainment, of whether that it's going to be broadcast from wherever else. Because if we don't embrace the nature of uh, virtual entertainment then right now, other type of entertainers will, as I said mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether they're comedians or uh, symphony or whatever else. And so we just need to jump on board and do that and embrace it. And and I would like to share something for those individuals um, who are on a fence about this. A couple things. Uh, My wife, she's in the healthcare industry and uh, she's been, you know, she's on like, basically on the front line dealing with with COVID. She's the director for uh, health education for Burlington County. And they set up testing sites and everything. So at the end of the week, she's always just drained. Mm -hmm. So what she started doing is having a virtual happy hour with her and her girlfriends. Mm -hmm. And they have hired a DJ. They've, They've hired a comedian. Hmm. They hired a singer. They have hired a poet. They haven't hired a magician yet. That's my wife. <laughs> that's okay. that's yeah. okay. They're they, just not sitting there and drinking with each other and talking and sharing stories. They're actually exactly. having an outside entertainer. Interesting. Exactly. Huh. So they have they all her girlfriends, all 15 of them, Friday, 7 o'clock. I'm in my man cave. They're out there. They have, I mean, while she's in her room. Right. And on 15 of her girlfriends, they have their bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. The entertainer comes on, does their thing. They interact with the entertainer, laugh, sing the songs with the singer or whatever, dance to the DJ, listen, snap their fingers to the poet. After the, 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 the entertainer is done, the entertainer leaves. The ladies continue to have their chat and everything else, and it's a good night, and they're ready for the next week. Fantastic. So people are doing that. And so that's just I'm just using it as a personal example that I know there are other people because I've been hired to do virtual uh, uh, happy hours. So they could be anything from just a small group to thousands. Yes. Yes. Now, here's the other thing. For those individuals who are on on offense, the playing field is level now. Mm -hmm. It really is. You are not just limited to your city your town and your community with this virtual thing. You got the entire world right now. So this is an opportunity. And guess what? There's enough for all of us. <laughs> it really is. It's a big pie. Someone, someone may not like Randy Shine's style, but they're going to like Magician Joe's style. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. <laughs> That is okay. Someone may not like Magician Joe's style, but they like Randy Shine's style. And it may not even be about the way I perform magic. It just could be a, my personality sure. or their personality, something that they resonate with. So the playing field is level and you have a broader reach. Two weeks ago, I did three virtual college shows in three different states. The first one was in Maryland. The second one was in Texas. The third one was in Florida. Wow. I could never have done three college shows in three different states in one day if it was live. Never. True. So what I'm saying is embrace this technology. And it's not as difficult as you think it is. It's not. This is where I say YouTube is really your friend. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) And and here's the other thing. Two things I did. YouTube, and you can find some great people who will break it down. Very simple. Trust me, because I'm not that tech guy. And the second thing is this. If you have a child a grandchild, a niece, a nephew who is 
under a certain age, mm -hmm. I would say 30 and younger, I would even go a little bit younger, pay them a hundred bucks to teach you, they'll be more than happy to, because they know this stuff. Oh boy, do they? Yes. They know this stuff. And so that minor investment, my niece Raven, how do you do this? Oh, Uncle Randy, shh. Oh, that's <laughs> it? All right. Here's 50 bucks. Yeah, here's some money. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, kid. Yeah. Cheaper than some consultants, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly. Randy, it's been great. Thank you so very much. It's uh, a lot of great advice. I didn't do a lot of talking. I was doing a lot of learning here. So <laughs> I'm glad to sit at your feet and listen to this. It was great. And I think all the listeners have uh, gotten a lot out of this also. I hope so, too, because I know we went all over the place. But <laughs> That's as, what conversations as, are about. Right. One of my friends said, Randy, you just have a lot in your mind. You just do this data dump. <laughs> and it just comes out. <laughs> jumble yeah so hopefully everyone got something look everyone who's listening thank you please support scott listen to his podcast and you know what tell a friend a fellow magician about the podcast uh because you never know if they never listen to it and this is good material good information uh a variety of information that trust me is useful uh scott thank you i appreciate you i can't wait till we can get together live. Yeah, my it's friend. been too long. Fifteen years is way too long. Fifteen but... <laughs> years, fifteen years, and Amazing. I can't wait to hear and connect with you and everyone else in the uh, Houston area. You're still in Houston, right? I am still Houston. That's right. That's yeah, right. In the Houston area. So as I close, I always like to ask my guests, "What is their magic word?" So, what is your phrase or philosophy of life? What do you live by? What is your magic word? Or not necessarily a word. It could be a sentence word. Oh no 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 no! I, I got one. It's 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 my thing. It's it's a it's a it's a, a Zulu word from South Africa. The word is umbutu. 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 It's spelled it's spelled with a U, but it's pronounced U. Like umbutu. Umbutu. It means I. It means I am because you are. You are because I am. <laughs> I am because you are, and you are because I am. Yeah. Umbutu. Yep, it speaks about the symbiotic relationship between mankind. It was made famous in a speech by Nelson Mandela. Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Well said. Thank you very much, Randy. This has been nothing short of just spectacular. I've enjoyed every moment of it, and I look forward to talking with you again, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Peace, love, and magic always. And so for the Magic Word Podcast, that was Randy Shine. This is Scotty Out. Thank you, Randy, very much for being my guest this week on this episode. This has been delightful. I've certainly learned a lot, and I hope that you, the listener, have as well. If you'd like to know who's going to be coming up next week, and for that matter, learn a lot more information, all you have to do is subscribe to our weekly pod letter. If you'll just go to the Magic Word podcast there, you should see a pop-up that will come on, and you just sign up very easy. And each week, you'll find out information that tells you who is on from week to week, who's coming up next week, and also some suggestions from the archives as to who we suggest that you might want to go back and hear again, maybe for your first time. And also, if we have contests, that we will announce those in the pod letter as well, reminding all of the listeners that you need to go and register. Well, we have, uh, in that regard, someone who is very interesting coming up again next week, and I don't want to expose it. However, that if you are a reader of the pod letter, you will know. And this is going to be another uh, great and exciting guest. And... Uh, it's uh, going to be fun. <laughs> That's all I can say. And also that she's going to be offering, yes, it's a she, uh, it's a woman who will be offering a, a copy of uh, a book that she has written. Okay, I'll probably give it away too much here then right now, but I, uh, but she's going to be giving away something then too. So you want to come back then next week. And also one other thing that you could do in addition to subscribing to our pod letter, is, to, which is free by the way, of course, is to uh, just help us out. If you can go to the iTunes store, if you use that to download and listen to your podcast uh, or whatever, if you go to the Play Store, I guess, if you listen to it on Android or however and wherever that you listen to these podcasts and you download them, 
please leave us a five-star review, if you will. That helps our podcast get known. And uh, one last thing, as we get into the holiday season, that's a time in which you're going to be buying more and more things. I want to remind you, if you'll just go to the bottom of the page on our website at themagicwordpodcast.com, there you'll see a link to Amazon. We are an Amazon affiliate, and every time you click on that, that will take you then to Amazon. It'll open up your account, and anything that you purchase, then we just gets uh, a few pennies back then from Amazon. So it's a way of you helping us by letting Amazon help us. So there you go. So until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember, Ubuntu. Yes. This is Scotty out. <laughs>